Uh, so first and foremost, thank you everyone and welcome to day two of the Charlottesville Women in Tech Create a New Story Summit 2020. We're so happy to have you here. My name is Elaine Chang and I'm a board member of Charlottesville Women in Tech. Uh, we're a local organization which creates a community for women and girls who are interested in or already pursuing a technology career. Our programming is focused on creating networks and relationships, providing resources and uh, connections in town and in our area. So um, the, the, this summit has been about um, really looking at our current state and saying that although this is a time of great challenges and lots of uh, like things that are on hold and unclear, that doesn't need to be true with your career. In fact, sometimes in these times, this is the greatest time to make a change uh, in your life. And so our three days of programming have been curated around creating that inspiration. And day two is focused on starting or transitioning a career into technology. And we're real, we have a whole full day curated around helping to see how you can make a bridge from wherever you're at today into perhaps a new career within technology or actually into a technology career. All right, with that, I am going to uh, start our, our, uh, our event officially with our first keynote. I'm pleased to introduce Nicole Case, who is going to talk to us and inspire us about creating our own story. Nicole is a career and leadership coach for women, uh, corporate leaders who are asking themselves, what's next? With over a decade of experience in corporate human resources, she's seen countless smart, driven, and talented women stall in their careers or continue working on in soul crushing jobs, which none of us should do. <laughs> And Nicole now helps women identify their strengths, set boundaries, and rebuild their confidences to find and succeed in their ideal careers. And she is here to help share that information with us today. Nicole, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Elaine, for having, for having me. And I just want to really quickly call out that your mom is here and she's really proud of you, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, mom. She is yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> That's she bad. is an amazing woman herself who never stalled in her career. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we all have, you know, someone in our, in our lives, whether it's our family or, fa or friends or just somebody that you've been inspired by. Um, in your in your career that you're able to to kind of model some of that afterwards. So that's awesome that she's here. Welcome, Carol. Um, all right. So yeah. So today we are going to talk about your career story. Like Elaine said, um, you know, a lot of things have been put on hold recently, or you know, we're feeling like we need to put some things on hold. And I am here to tell you that 2021 can be your year. So we're going to talk today about getting a head start on your career story in 2021. So we're going to do um, a little bit of a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of storytelling and a lot of actionable steps that you can take leaving here. So please put your questions in the chat. When we get to the end of the presentation, that's when I'll ask if you know, whoever wants to come on camera and, and chat live. That's great. If not, we can just continue chatting. Um, in the chat in the chat function. But first, I just want to talk to you just a little bit um, about me. Thank you, Elaine, for that introduction. But there was some th stuff in there that that I left out. And frankly, I don't like talking about all that much. But first and foremost, I'm not sure if you've all heard, here's another trivia question for you. But the average student loan debt in 2018 was $32,731. And the average monthly payment was $339. So that's a lot of money, right? That's probably a really nice car, really nice car payment. Um, you know, I, I believe absolutely that the, the student loan debt crisis is gonna be one of the, the next um, big crises that we are gonna have to face as a country, particularly um, in, in this environment where so many people um, unfortunately have lost, have lost jobs or been out of jobs for, for a little while and they're, really, um, and they're really struggling to keep up. So that's the app. That was what the average student loan um, debt was in 2018. But this was my student loan debt number. 
my, and of course this is between my husband and I both, but you know, we're a team. So we're, we're tackling this together, but our student loan debt together was $248,000. Now that's not something that, you know, we, we didn't take out all $248,000, you know, we, you know, um, over, over the course of 10 years or so, you know, compounding interest makes a big difference as we learned. Um, but yeah, that was our number. And we had a lot of shame and a lot of guilt around that. Um, like we were talking a little bit earlier, I shared that, you know, we're from a small town in Western rural Pennsylvania, um, about two hours north of Pittsburgh. And, you know, we came from a working, both working class families. We were first generation college students, <laughs> frankly, didn't really know what we were doing. And we graduated in 2009 during that last recession that we had. And we knew that we needed to get jobs and we knew we needed to move in order to be able to afford the $2,100 a month payment on our student loans. And this really created a black cloud over us. And it really dictated every decision that we made. No, I'm sorry, we can't come to your wedding. No, we're sorry, we can't go on vacation you know, we can't go out to eat or we shouldn't go out to eat. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't spend money on this. Everything was such a guilt ridden decision at any time it came with money. And frankly, this number in this story really became part of my identity. It really started to define me and it really started to become the starring role in my career, in my life story. I remember a couple of years ago when I was um, driving to one of my big first first jobs and I'm getting ready to get on the highway and I'm watching all of the other cars kind of flying past me as I'm trying to merge on. And we're all, you know, presumably going to our, our corporate jobs at the same time. And I thought to myself, is this it? You know, you go to college, you work really hard, you know, you, you get a job that's just okay. Um, just for the paycheck to go back to paying for the loans that were required to take out to pay for the education that was required to get the job that I had. This made absolutely no sense to me, but I frankly just didn't know what to do. I mean, $248,000, I mean, we were not making a dent in any of this. Even the $2,100 a month was barely touching our principal. And so I had felt just so helpless and so out of control that I just decided, okay, well, we're just going to be paying on our loans until we died. And that's just that. But one Saturday afternoon, my husband and I were watching um, one of those tiny house shows. Do you have you ever watched any of those shows where it's usually like a family of four that's trying to find a teeny tiny 300 square foot uh, tiny home to run their catering business out of? Usually pretty ridiculous. But this one particular show was um, was talking about how this husband and wife um, had lost their home due to a wildfire they were in the mountains and they were able to see that the wildfire was coming towards them and they had 20 minutes to gather everything that they could into their little car and get out of there and unfortunately they did lose everything they their their house completely burnt down and they decided to rebuild in that same place in that same piece of land but they decided to build a tiny house because in that moment when they're you know trying to drag you know whatever they could into their car they realized what they valued most and they realized what was more, most important to them. So they realized they didn't need all that space. And in that moment, my husband turns to me and he goes, quick, this house is on fire. You have 10 minutes to grab what you can. What do you take? And I like, looked around the house and I'm like, our cats? Like there was nothing in this house, nothing about this lifestyle that we, that we had been living that I felt was worth saving. It wasn't as valuable to me as what I thought. And so it clicked in that moment. I'm like, Am I really living the life that I want to live? If I know what my values are and they are not aligned to the lifestyle or the career that I want to have, then again, what is the point? Now, I know that 2020 has been really tough. There has been a lot of losses. We have lost jobs, we've lost businesses, and lives have been lost. And again, it's been incredibly, incredibly tough but frankly, I am sick of talking about how tough it is. I am sick of wallowing in this self-pity party that many of us have started. And it's becoming part of our stories. And if we aren't careful, we are going to start to be identified by this year and by this point in time. So again, it's clear that there are lots of things that are outside of our control. And obviously this pandemic is, is hanging around for a lot longer than what anybody ever thought. But I challenge you to think about the things that are within your control. And I challenge you to think about your career 
as you begin and as we can begin to move forward. So today, I'm going to talk to you about taking control of your career story and your life story. We're going to talk about how to set and align your core values so that you can make 2021 one for the history books in all the best ways. So we're going to talk about your core values and how those are your foundation for everything. This is your foundation for your career and your life story. And then we're going to talk about how aligning those core values with your personal brand is critical to getting ahead in your career. And then finally, we're going to talk about setting boundaries and how by setting those boundaries that align with those core values, they will actually make you more effective and help you perform better at work and at home. So with core values, whether or not you've sat down to intentionally set them or not, you have them. Um, your gut knows what those are, right? So anytime you're faced with a decision or a situation that tests your core values, your gut tells you. So you know what that feeling is, right? You know, you know that tightness in your stomach, maybe you get butterflies or maybe you have an upset stomach. Sometimes we ignore it because in our, our brains, our egos make it in the way. And afterwards we look back and we're like, wow, yeah, I should have just trusted our gut on that one, right? Has that ever happened to you? Put a, put a, um, put a why in the comments if you've ever you know, been tested and you're like, shoot, I should have just listened to my gut there. Anyone have that experience? Yeah, yeah, we've all, we've all done it, right? And so, you know, what sometimes we don't listen to our gut or we don't think about our, our core values when it comes to decision making, we can pay that price later. So again, you have a set of core values, even if you haven't sat down to write them out. And, you know, today we're, we're talking about how, um, how your core values can align with your career. And I don't necessarily have time to sit down and talk to you about how you identify those specifically. And to be perfectly honest, it takes a little bit of time. Um, to do it in some reflection. So what I did for you is I actually created a workbook um, and um, I'm going to put it in the chat here so you all can um, download it later and sit down um, and sit down and, you know, kind of work through um, this activity that I do actually with all of my clients on setting your core value. So again, we, we don't have time to go through it today um, in person, but I, I have given you some homework for a little bit later on. Okay. So again, your core values is the foundation for everything, for everything in your career, for your personal brand and your values, you know, for how you choose to raise your kids, for the partner that you seek out and everything that you do for your, in your life, really the foundation of it is with your core values. So um, again, by identifying them, you can actually make better, faster, and more confident career and life decisions. So several years ago in my career, I had the opportunity to interview at Google. And this was um, kind of at the height of great place to work for Google, right? This was back um, when uh, the, the book called Work, uh, work Rules by Laszlo Block, their head of HR that came out. Um, the movie, The Internship with Vince Vaughn had just come out. So this was peak, you know, Google, everybody wants to work there. And I'm sure everyone, a lot of people still want to work there, but this was kind of before the, you know, manifesto where, you know, women are physically incapable of being in leadership or doing engineering and anti, you know, antitrust, you know, discrimination lawsuits and all that stuff. But anyway, so it was really exciting to be invited to interview at Google. And the recruiter sent me an email on a Sunday, which looking back on that was kind of my first red flag, right? Why is, why are you working on a Sunday? Um, and, uh, and so anyway, so they, they invited me to the interview. I flew out there from North Carolina, flew out to California for final, for the final interview round. And, you know, I get on site, you know, I see the Google Plex, you know, I see all the, the fun things on campus. I'm driving around tech, checking everything out. And the next day, whenever I go in for my actual interview day, you know, my interview was in a really nondescript, you know, office building. I mean, let's be clear, Google, Google has multiple office buildings. So, you know, not all of them, you know, look like, look super fancy, like the, like the traditional Google Plex does, but it was a, you know, kind of, you know, normal nondescript looking office, one story office building, you know, walk in, everything's bright and light and lots of fun colors. And, you know, the woman at the front desk was super lovely and everyone was nice. And there was a bunch of people that were there for, for interviews too, for different roles. But one of the things that I noticed um, right away for me was the amount of food that they had there, um, you know, floor to ceiling of snacks. And it's not like when you go get your coffee and you got to press the button on like the fake cappuccino machine in the break room. 
it, you had a barista, you know, behind the counter, you know, making, making your coffee fresh. And again, it was all free. That was one of the, that was one of the big, the, the big perks or benefits um, of working at Google was all the free food that you got. But for me kind of seeing it in person, honestly, was, I was like, this feels a little excessive. This feels a little elitist, to be honest, knowing the, um, the homeless population, the home, the, the homeless, um, crisis that, that, um, was, and is still happening in the Bay area. It just kind of felt a little, kind of felt a little icky to be perfectly honest. Um, but then, you know, I, I get into my interview room, I interview with two people for 30 minutes. Um, they're perfectly lovely. And, you know, they're talking to me about, you know, all, again, all the perks, all the great things about, about working at Google and, and they're starting to describe some things. And I kept saying, yeah, my company has that too. Yeah. My company has that too. So it was so fascinating to me to have built up in my head this dream job at Google. And to be honest, it didn't seem to be all that different from the job that I had currently had, except Google's printing money and, you know, whatever you're printing money, there's, there's certainly some benefits there. But then the other thing that had happened was I was, uh, I had my, my last two interviews um, for the day. You know, again, they were 30 minute interviews, super quick. They're famous for their interview process, their efficient interview process. But the two people that I interviewed with last didn't come over to the to the conference room that I was in in person. They decided to take the call from from their office from a phone because they didn't want to walk across campus to meet me in person. And so I'm sitting here thinking Google paid thousands of dollars to fly me across the country for two hours worth of interviews. And I only met with two people in person. It was, again, kind of strange. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not really feeling this. I don't know if this is really aligning to my values and, and what and what I really want. Um, and luckily, the 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 end of the story is that I didn't get the job. I think um, you know I was kind of putting out some vibes that I'm like I don't know this feels really elitist. This feels like you know they're acting like you know I'm the you know I should be grateful that they called me and all this stuff. I don't know. It just it just wasn't aligning with me. But they didn't give me the job anyway. Um, which is great because I'm not sure that I would have wanted to, wanted to be the person to tell Google no. But what would have happened if I did get the job and I did take it? What happened? What would have happened had I gone against my values, gone against my gut, and taken a job that I would have had to have completely relocated my husband and I across across country, and particularly to a location that we absolutely could not afford? What could have happened, right? So um, luckily, I feel like I, you know, I kind of dodged a bullet on that one. But it's this story is to highlight for you that again, your core values, when you are in the job search, or even just looking for, you know, looking for that next step, looking for that promotion um, in your current company, aligning to your, your values is so critically important. And if you are in the job search right now, um, I don't know if you're experiencing you know, uh, applying to a million different jobs out there, you know, tossing out, out applications and just hoping somebody calls because you believe that because in hashtag 2020, you know, nobody's hiring. And frankly, that's just not true. And one of the things that I work with my clients on is by, again, getting super clear on your values, your strengths and how you work best to really nail down the types of roles and the companies that you want to work for. So you aren't spending a ton of time tossing out applications just randomly all over the place. That wastes a ton of time and a ton of energy. And frankly, it's really defeating at the end of the day, whenever you're not getting the callbacks that you think that you think that you, you should based on the volume that you're putting out there. So when you are sitting down to start a, start a new job search, or you're, again, you're considering um, a promotion or taking a, taking a, taking a shift in your career, here's some other things other than after setting your, after setting your core values, here's some other things that you can be thinking about. So one of the questions um, that I talk with my clients on is just, frankly, what does your best day look like? What lights you up? What gets you really, really excited? And what does your worst days look like? What really drains you? And it's not to say that, you know, um, you try to find that perfect job. And actually, you'll never hear me say dream job in my in my vocabulary, because I don't believe there is there is a dream job out there um, that that insinuates that there is a job that's absolutely perfect. And that's just not true. But it's helpful to understand what lights you up and what drains you so you can make some better choices. What um, what about the size of the organization? Do you want to work in a public or a private um, company, a, co a company that's a little bit more structured or maybe that's a little bit ambiguous? This depends on 
um, if you know, kind of how you work and, and what your preference is. And it might be different based on where you're at in your career today. So you might be a little bit earlier in your career and you may want a larger organization with, a lots, more, with lots more infrastructure and training available. And that's great. Or you may be in a place where, you know what, I've done all that. I'm ready to build myself. I'm, really, I'm ready to have a bit more autonomy and I'm ready to um, take the charge on some things. And then I think one of the most important questions to ask yourself is what is important to you or what is valuable to you in a manager, right? So, you know, is this somebody that you want to be more hands on or is this someone that, you know, you they want to say, here's your direction and off you go and they completely trust you to, to, to do what you need to do? Or do you, do you like having frequent feedback and frequent affirmation that things are going well? Or again, are you, you know, fine, you know, working really, really independently? And again, this is going to change over time, but as you are um, st either starting a new job search or again, thinking about, um, thinking about a promotion or a shift in your career, walking through some of these, walking through some of these questions are going to be really, really helpful so that you can get super aligned on what's important to you. And that's going to come out in the interview process. I promise you, like I shared about my, my um, ex, um, experience with Google, that it wasn't aligning for me. And I wasn't, I wasn't finding an opportunity at Google that I, that I thought was going to be best for my career. And that certainly came out in my interview. So again, understanding your values and what's important to you will actually help you land your job faster because you know what good looks like and you're not going to waste your time and energy on jobs that aren't going to be a good fit. So now that we have um, identified your core values, now we can start thinking about your personal brand. And sometimes I get eye rolls whenever I mention personal branding. So what do you think of when you hear the phrase personal branding? Put it in the comments. What do you think of? Sometimes I hear um, phrases like, you know, it can feel really fluffy. It doesn't really matter. You know, we don't, it's not something we need to focus on. Yes, yeah, self-promotion, salesy, it feels not genuine um, or it feels fake, which is actually the exact opposite. Um, personal branding is a huge umbrella for things like your personal mission statement, you know, what cover photo should be on your LinkedIn page. But today what I'm really going to focus on is um, personal brand in the most simplest terms, which is that your personal brand is how you show up in the world and how the world perceives you. So, you know, your personal brand, again, is what other people think of you. And then the, per the act of personal branding is how you are actually influencing what that perception is of you. So this, is in this will include things like how and if you speak up in meetings, how you dress, how are you known in your industry more broadly, and are you somebody that put yourself out there for, for projects or do you wait to be tapped on the shoulder? And this is particularly important if, if you are making a shift um, in your career, if you're thinking about, um, you know, shifting either into a technology position or you're thinking about maybe shifting into leadership, your personal brand, regardless of what stage of the game you're in in your career, is going to be super critical. So the two biggest mistakes that I see people make when they are curating or crafting their personal brand is one, giving control to someone else. So this is something, um, this is something that happens particularly earlier in people's careers, um, but, but this can happen at any time when, you know, you kind of, you put your nose down, you know, you're doing your great work and you're just kind of expecting your boss or somebody to notice that you're doing a great job and tap you on the shoulder for something, you know. Um, I had a woman come to me several months ago who needed help with a job search because the last four jobs that she had was just her boss tapping her on the shoulder saying, hey, I think you'd be good at this. Why don't you go over there? And while that's really great, you know, and, and clearly she was doing something right because she was getting tapped on the shoulders for things. But because she relied on that as her sole strategy in her career path she ended up being in jobs that she actually really didn't like. And then she was, you know, she was on a path that she's like, now I'm kind of feel kind of stuck. I don't know how to make a shift at this point. So again, do not give someone else, your boss, your VP, your spouse, your parents, anybody else control over your career narrative. The other mi mistake that I, that I see people doing is trying to copy someone else. So, you know, obviously it's really important to have those mentors and to have those people that we look up to, but really think about the fact that, um, you know, you are, you, you are a unique individual and how you show up should be authentic 
and genuine for you. And if you are out there trying to copy somebody else's communication style or trying to copy how somebody else shows up, that's going to feel flat and people are going to see that and people are going to recognize that and it's not going to feel good to you. And frankly, that sounds really, really, um, really draining. But one of the um, reasons why I see that people kind of give up control over, over their personal brand or they start emulating other people is because they just don't know where they want to take their career. So once you've identified what your core values are, what's important to you at work, kind of what that environment is that you think you're that you're going to thrive in, then you can start determining what the direction is that you actually want to go in. And, you know, you don't need to determine every single step. It doesn't have to be perfect and you don't have to think about, you know, what's that last job I get before retirement, which I think is silly because, you know, if you think back over the last 10 or 15 years, the, the types of jobs and the type of work that didn't even exist 10 or 15 years ago. So I think it's kind of silly to try to project out that far, um, knowing that the world of work is likely going to change by that time, even in the next five years, you know, I, I, I'm so excited to see what, what life's going to look like then. And again, you can change your mind too. You, you are absolutely allowed to change your mind, but it's important to really kind of have an idea in a direction so that you can um, you can start figuring out how you want to show up. So showing up as you know a senior engineer is going to probably look a little different than showing up as say an outside sales executive, right? Those those lifestyles are are very different. The expectations for the role is very different. So if you have a, a little bit of an idea of the direction that you want to go, that's then you can start curating. Um, what that what that brand looks like both internally to your company and out um, and externally. So while I spent over 10 years in corporate HR, I was one of those people that I got to be part of those conversations where, you know, all the leaders are getting together and they're talking about who gets a promotion, who gets the raise, who gets that to lead that big project or who's getting laid off. And I'm sorry to report that again, those who are working hard at their jobs and those who are, who are just keeping their heads down and getting stuff done, those people are not the ones that are getting the raises or getting the promotions or the best projects. The people who are, are the people who are visible, the people who are showing up and the people who are making the biggest impact in the business and moving the business forward. And so, so much of, of your personal brand is just how you show up. So if you want to be the head of engineering, how do you show up like that person today? How do you start projecting that, um, that energy um, today? So a few years ago, this was, um, uh, this was shortly after my, my Google experience. Um, I had the opportunity to, um, to take on a different role in my company. I was bored, I was ready to shift. I shifted into a program management role. And about a year and a half into that role, um, my, my, my boss called me again, I'm in, I'm in North Carolina and the company's headquartered in, in, in Sunnyvale, California. My boss calls me on a Friday afternoon. I'll never forget this. She calls me. It's like three o'clock my time. And she goes, Nicole, some decisions have been made. Big decisions have been made. I need you to come out here in, to California on Monday. Can you make that happen? And I said, yeah, I, I, I can totally make that happen. I'm, you know, in a, in a position um, in my life where I can, I can, I can drop things really quickly and travel like that. So get out there on Monday and she tells me, okay, so the company has made the decision to completely rip out our HCM or our human capital management system and replace it with, um, with a really big, um, uh, well-known system. And there's going to be five work streams on how we implement this system and you're going to lead one of them. And I'm like, okay. So I went from being an HR person to a program manager to a system implementator. Okay, great. So um, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and of course, it was great to, um, to have somebody tap me on the shoulder and say, you know, we, we'd like for you to, to lead this work stream. Um, but let's be clear, the person that, that they actually wanted to have do this, do this work um, had quit the month before. So they were kind of stuck with me. But, um, but I was not going to let that stop me. I had no idea what I was doing. I was completely unprepared for this. Um, but I was not going to let that stop me from seizing a, a career defining opportunity. And if you've ever implemented um, a system before, um, you, know, you may be familiar with, you know, contracting with a consulting firm to kind of help you with, with, the, with the implementation. And so we did that. We, we contracted with, um, with one of the big four consulting firms and each work stream was assigned, you know, a principal consultant. And so Randall was my consultant, lovely. 
lovely man. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure somebody gave him a heads up that like, Hey, this girl does not know what she's doing. You're going to need to help her along. Um, which I'm sure he thought was just fantastic because of course the work stream that I was leading was the first one that was going to get out the door. And it was the foundation for pretty much, for pretty much all of the, the philosophical performance and talent, uh, uh, talent, uh, programs for the entire global company. Um, but so throughout this process, I needed to learn how to um, implement a new system. I needed to learn um, agile methodology, and I needed to learn how to lead a team through agile methodology that sat in California while I was in while I was in North Carolina. And so basically, I ended up living in California for for about three months during that time. But um, throughout this process, there was there um, was a really big meeting that everybody needed to get together. So if you're familiar with the agile methodology, you know you're you're iterating as you go, and you kind of get together and say, "This is what we got." You know, what do we think? Do we need to change some things? And you kind of go back and, and, and you can, and you and you make some adjustments if you need to. So there was this huge meeting um, in California. We went to actually the consultants um, headquarters in downtown San Jose and all of the executives in HR are there. All of the executive sponsors for this twelve million dollar project are there and all of the work streams we're trying, we're supposed to present. And, um, and typically it's the consultant that leads that presentation and kind of walks through a two or three hour, you know, demo of, of the system. And I looked at Randall and I said, you are not presenting this. I'm going to present this. You know, this is actually where I shine the presentation piece and communicating and influencing people. That's where I shine. I'm going to do this presentation. He was like, yeah, girl, rock on. So I did this presentation um, you know, obviously I'm a little bit nervous, but you know, what's important to me whenever I am in really high stakes presentations, or if I'm in an interview, I make sure I dress the part. So that day I made sure I showed up in my sassy shoes because those are the shoes that make me feel super powerful. I feel super grounded. And so I rocked that presentation. And I remember very specifically after that presentation, one of the executives from our company, she was new, she was brand new to the organization, had only been there a few weeks, and her and I had never met before. And she came up to me after the presentation was over and she said, you know, just wanted to introduce myself and let you know how awesome that presentation was. She said, I actually came in a few minutes late and I missed the introduction. So I actually thought you were the consultant. And so in that moment, I was like, this is my personal brand in action. I seized an opportunity. I am known for you know, taking, taking on a challenge and not being afraid of it, not being afraid, even if I'm completely scared, I'm going to do it scared anyway. And I'm going to show up looking, looking in my most powerful, authentic self. And so I do want to pause here just to, just for a quick moment, just to um, talk really quickly about um, how, what women wear and how women show up in the workplace in terms of their clothes, because so many women are constantly criticized or critiqued for what they wear. You know, if you look um, out in the out in the in the media, you know, women are constantly being talk, talking about what they're wearing versus what they're saying, what they've accomplished. And that never happens to men, which is really frustrating. Um, so I don't want to overlook that fact. However, I want you to think about when you are showing up to really important meetings or showing up to a high stakes um, sort of a situation, are you showing up in a way that makes you feel really powerful and really in your, in your authentic, um, authentic self? And if that for you is jeans and sneakers, rock on and, and own that. For me, again, it's my sashy shoes and it's, it's in a blazer. I am um, kind of the blazer queen. I'm known for, for wearing jackets. So figure out who that is and what that is for you and own that and be super proud and super confident in whatever, whatever that is. But I can tell you that if you're showing up to a presentation or an interview in an outfit that you really, really love, you're going to perform better. Um, okay, so you know, with with personal branding, I would be really remiss if I did not mention very quickly about networking. And so the best time to um, be building your brand and networking with other people, particularly externally in your in your industry, is before you need a new job. So um, here are a couple of things that you can do as you are um, as you are trying to build your community, build your network, attend virtual events like this one. 
Um, so everybody who's who's on here today, you know, you're you're showing up and doing the right thing by not only learning something new, you know, gaining more information, getting deeper of an expert in your space, but you're also meeting people. So if you have not started connecting with people on Twitter or on LinkedIn, you're missing an opportunity here. I recognize that you know it's tough networking and you know in a virtual environment. But I would also challenge you that it's really cool because you don't have to leave the comfort of your home and you're likely able to meet people that you would otherwise not um, get a chance to meet, meet in person. Comment on industry forums and articles. So, you know, if there's um, a, a, an article or something posted online that you have something to say about it, you know, don't just like it and scroll past. Start, um, start having conversations um, in the comments. Publish your own articles and posts. There is not a very large barrier to being published anymore. So there's really no excuse why you can't start putting your own thoughts and your ideas out there. And so then you start to get known in your industry and you start to get known in the community for, for your ideas. And maybe when a job does come available, somebody reaches out to you and say, hey, I thought of you when I saw this. Um, a really important piece of this networking piece is to be actually building relationships because kind of back to this, your first thoughts around, um, around uh, personal branding, building relationships should be really authentic, really intentional, um, you know, so it doesn't feel like you're just, you know, out there trying to, you know, uh, ask a perfect stranger for a job. And, you know, maybe you ask somebody for a 15 minute coffee chat, um, you know, again, to build that relationship a little bit more. And, and note that I didn't say, you know, ask somebody, you know, for, for a coffee chat so you can ask them for a job. Ask them about their career. Ask them about their, their career path. What do they like about their job? What do they don't like about their job? What's been surprising to them in their career? Make it about them when you're, when you're doing these sort of conversations. And I can tell you, this not only helps build relationships, which is really great, which is really important to me, which is one of my values, but it also, um, it also may lead to a job. I had a client that I just finished wrapping up working with who you know, reached out to somebody at a company that she was really interested in, who was already in a job that she thought that she wanted and had one of these 15 minute coffee chats Lo and behold, three weeks later, she has a job offer and she just started that new job um, two weeks ago. So I'm super proud, super proud of her. So if you are concerned, if you're frustrated about um, about, you know, job searching today and that you're not getting callbacks, I challenge you to really step up that networking piece and start building relation, really genuine, authentic relationships with people. And I promise you those opportunities will come. So. I challenge each of you as you're walking away today to visualize your highest self and then start showing up as her. And so um, kind of one of the final things that I want to want to talk to you about is setting boundaries. And, you know, boundaries are just those guidelines or rules of engagement or expectations for how you interact with how you interact with the world and how you want the world to interact with you. And so at the beginning of this pandemic, um, the Lean In organization, Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg's organization, partnered with McKinsey um, on, on studying women in the workplace throughout this pandemic. And what they found was that women are two times more likely to take the lead on child rearing, caring for sick family members, you know, all the, the home sort of stuff. And this is amounting to 20 hours more week of work than what they had already had coming into this pandemic. So we're talking a part-time job that women have picked up. And what they've recently found, which I am just devastated by, is that one in three women have considered either stepping back from their career in a, in a, in a you know, stepping back in a way or completely leaving the workforce um, completely. And this is, and this is from women from, you know, from, the most senior level positions all the way, all the way down in the organization. And this, if this is true, if this ends up happening, then we are going to completely erase any of the progress that we have made as women in the workplace in the last 10 years. And that's just not okay. And so one of the ways we can combat some of that is by setting really strong boundaries at home, at work, and with ourselves. And so some of the ways to do that is by first knowing your values. So we've talked about that, we've done that. Um, but then by clarifying your role and your expectations, and again, this is both at work and at home. You know, if you're unsure about what your expectations are at work, talk, sit down and talk to your boss about it. If, you're, if, you're, if you think you might be working on things that you maybe, maybe you shouldn't, or maybe you're working towards a deadline that you know, maybe doesn't really exist, um, make sure you're sitting down and clarifying that. 
determine how loose or how rigid you want these boundaries to be. You get to choose this. So there's going to be certain things that are non-negotiables for you, hard line in the sand. And there's some things that you're like, okay, based on the situation, I'm happy to, to, to make, to make an exception here. But the point is, is that you get to choose that you are in control. Make sure you communicate your boundaries clearly, again, both at work and at home, that if you have an expectation and you have a boundary around no one is going to bother me between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. because I'm drinking my coffee, communicate that to, to your roommates or communicate that to your family at home so that you can get, you know, that, that, that little bit of time to, you know, get yourself centered for the day. And then if, and what I will tell you is that you are going to get people that will violate your boundaries and you need to call those out and you need to call them out very quickly because if you don't and you just kind of let it slide, then they're not going to recognize that this was a boundary for you or they're not going to take it seriously. And you will absolutely get violations, especially if you're setting boundaries or a new boundary for the first time. And if you are getting a lot of pushback around this, then it's likely that boundary needed to be in place. And then again, be consistent. I talked a little bit uh, a few moments ago about determining how loose or how rigid, but the important thing here is it's, uh, it's important to be as consistent as possible with these boundaries so that again, um, you're able to actually make some headway with this. One thing that I will caution you on is on over rotation. So there, there can be certain boundaries that we wanna put into place that we might go a little overboard on and it no longer serves us. For me personally, whenever I, I have um, boundaries around, you know, say food, for example, you know, I think we're, there's many of us that are trying to lose that COVID-15 because that's a real thing. Not all of us, you know, got, you know, got really into exercise uh, throughout the quarantine. Some of us got really into food. So, um, so for me, if, I, if I'm trying to put some boundaries in place over eating healthy, I know that I can over rotate on that. Um, I had an eating disorder when I was, when I was growing up and when I was younger. And so I know that that is a trigger for me and that I, I tend to be an all or nothing or get super, super rigid on that. So just think about what those triggers are for you or what those areas are for you and just be aware of those. And so when you are, you know, when you're able to put some really strong boundaries in place, you're able to get super clear about your priorities and you're able to focus on the right things. So setting boundaries with others and ourselves keeps us accountable to staying in alignment with our values. And I can tell you that at work, if you're putting great boundaries in place and talking about um, what are the priorities that you should be focused on, that's going to look really good um, on you in, in front of leadership. Because again, you're not just somebody that's always saying yes and just checking the box and getting the tasks done. You're actually recognizing that the work that you do needs to be the right stuff so that you're actually making um, an impact in the business. So today we've talked about a lot, right? Um, we've talked about how our core values are our foundation for our career and our life stories and that we, we control our personal brand narrative. And by setting boundaries, we will actually be able to be more focused on the right priorities. And we will actually be able to be more successful in our careers and at life on our own terms. And so we have a couple of actions that we're going to walk away today with, right? So um, we're going to talk, we're going to identify our core values. We're going to identify where we want to go and we're going to start showing up as that person now. And we're going to network to build our community and we're going to set really strong boundaries. So I want to kind of go back to, um, to my opening story about our student loan debt. Um, shortly after, um, shortly after we watched that tiny house hunter show, my husband and I did some math. And we realized that if we sold um, our little house that we had bought, you know, in 2013, kind of at the bottom of the, of the housing market, if we sold that house, moved to a one bedroom, one bathroom apartment with heavy emphasis on the one bathroom, um, if we did that for four years, um, we could actually pay off our student loans. Um, we'd have to be really, really, um, really thoughtful. We'd have to be, you know, put some really strong boundaries in place to make that happen, but we could do it in four years. Um, but I'm here to tell you that not only did we do that, not only did we pay off our student loans, we also saved for a 20% down payment on our dream home that we just recently built. And we did it all in three years. So um, I'm here to tell you that um, there are 49 days left in the year 2020. And this is the perfect time to start taking some of these actions that we talked about so that you can make 
2021 your best year and have an amazing career story this time next year. So thank you so much. Um, I, I see the, um, the chat going, I'm having a hard time keeping up with it. No, um, so if there's anyone that wants to come on and, and ask some questions. That's right. Would, does anyone, I, I, uh, I do see one person who's requested who maybe, or maybe did not know that they requested. So I'm going to look okay. on and if they do, uh, not want to share, uh, we'll, we'll find out. So let's okay. see, Amanda. Am I successfully letting you on here? Maybe not. Okay. If anybody wants to um, come on, they just need to hit the ask um, to share their video and audio and I can let them on. Otherwise, um, I, I was scanning through the um, um, comments. A lot of people commented on the, on the clothing, I, I thought, oh, yeah. which is really interesting. And it is something that I do, you know, you do, I feel like the men's wardrobe is so much more straightforward. Oh, it is. Casual, they wear a polo and pants and if it's yeah. not casual, you know, like it's just, you know, it's just, it's just tie in a shirt or a suit or whatever. And it's just so stinking straightforward. I know. One thing that I've done in my life is try to eliminate a lot of thinking about, about clothes. Yes. And um, I, I have gone down to, I only wear black. Mm -hmm. And, and even in that I only wear, and I only wear pants. I don't like, I don't wear skirts. So all you, I rem, I, all the comments about the skirts are hilarious. And when I first started working, it was literally not in the dress code for, that women could wear pants. You, you literally could not oh, wow. uh, in our work dress code. And, um, and, and then I also, a lot of times I have like the same black sweater. It, it, I have like 10 of them. And, and I, yeah. I like, don't even care. I'm like, yep, let me, let me just, I'm going to wear the same darn thing every day. I sometimes um, mix it up with different colored shoes because I do think shoes are fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the clothes thing is such an interesting. Yeah. You know, I love, I love what you said though, that you only wear black and you only wear pants. You know, I I've always loved fashion. I've always, I've always loved dressing up. That's just me. I just, I personally really, really enjoy it. But since um, lockdown happened and since COVID happened, I was like, I need to simplify my life. And so I, in a very similar way, I decided I'm only wearing white. I think I look great on camera with white um, and it's super simple. So I like, okay, let me grab all my white shirts. So I wear a white top and I wear black leggings every single yeah. day and I don't have to think about it. And I, you know, again, it's authentic to me. It feels good. I feel strong yeah. in it. And so, you know, I just encourage women to think about what is that for you? And again, it can totally be, you know, jeans yeah, and a t-shirt sure. um, is it just as long. And it was funny. I've, I've worked in companies where there was a very strict dress code. You know, you were suited up every day. Yes, you got to wear jeans on Friday. Um, but, you know, you know, and that and that worked for me because I like dressing up. But, you know, it's 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 funny to think that, um, that, you know, we need to put these parameters in place, um, in order to, you know, in order for us to work more effectively. And of course, all of those dress codes that are out there, um, very much, um, impact women and women of color way more than, than it does, than it does the men. But again, I still think that it's not vain or frivolous to think about what you wear. Um, because frankly, you know, people are going to see you, you know, people are seeing you and that's your, their first impression of you. And once again, if you feel powerful in it, you're going to project that. Yeah. I, I think there's a big difference between looking, you know, clean and, you know, you know yeah. what, you know, whatever. I don't even know what to say to that versus like a, a suit with a skirt, you right. know, and high heels, you know, yeah. And like yeah. somebody was making comments about the high heels and I like, yeah, I mean, they're not good for your feet. <laughs> <laughs> I wear a lot of wedges. I like wearing, I like wearing wedges. That's why you saw my sassy, my sassy shoes. I like to wear wedges. I feel, I feel yeah. really comfortable um, in those, but I'm also five two. Yeah. So, um, so I, you know, I, I like wearing, wearing a little bit of a, like wearing a little bit of a heel, but there was someone that said something to me years ago um, about, you know, when you walk into your, walk into a room and if you want to gain some confidence right away, imagine that you are the tallest person there mm -hmm. and that you're just walking and you're just like looking over, looking over everybody's heads. And for me, that's always been kind of funny because again, I'm usually the shortest person in the room, mm -hmm. but, it, um, but it works. Yeah. Well, and I, it's back to your point, you know, whether you wear heels or you don't wear heels or you, you know, yeah. you, you dress in a skirt. Now I don't have anything wrong with skirts um, at all. 
but what you wear is what you feel comfortable in and what makes you feel great. And that's what you should wear. And I think absolutely. And I think you can look as awesome and as professional in a t-shirt and jeans as you can in a suit. Yeah, absolutely. I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And and I would, I would say um, I had a, I was having a conversation with a fellow coach a few weeks ago and she was coaching um, a woman who wants to be, wants to be a CEO. She had shared that she wants to be a CEO in the next five years. And they were talking through kind of the barriers or what's, what's been keeping, what's been holding her back from, from making some progression. And one of the things they talked about was, um, you know, kind of how she's showing up in the morning. She's like, well, I don't have time to get up and get all dolled up. And I, I don't have time to do all this. She's like, you know, I roll out of bed five minutes before my first call. And my, my friend who's a coach well, said back to her, well, do you think the CEO does that? Do you think the CEO rolls out of bed five minutes before their first call? It's unlikely that they do. So again, it's kind of going back to who is it that you want to be? Start showing up as that person now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't mean that that CEO has to wear a skirt. It's just, you know, no. you should be ready and look professional. You should be polished. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you should be polished, whatever that is for you. Washed, yeah. I think sometimes. You know, that's, that's ideal. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, okay, well, I, um, uh, I'm going to wrap us up. Um, thank you, Nicole, so much for being with us today. This was uh, so fantastic. I loved how, how, how inspiring it was, but also how incredibly practical it was. So many hints and things for, for, for everyone to think about as they're looking at, is this the time for me? And I think the time is yes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it is absolutely yeah. Yeah, companies are hiring and the company and the, and the roles that they're hiring are super critical to their business because, right, you know, people are, I mean, let's be real, people are being a little bit more cautious depending on what business you're in, but the roles that they are hiring for are the critical ones. So, you know, that if you're landing one of those jobs, they are like, oh my gosh, we needed you so badly. So, um, so yeah, so, so people are hiring. Um, it's just, it's just competitive out there. So network your face off and just start showing up as your best self align to your values and you'll get there. All right.